want to talk to you today about the economy in China because uh, there's things developing over there uh, right now that remind me an awful lot of what happened in Japan uh, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, and, you know, Mark Twain said history doesn't repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes. And I think this is one of those situations. After World War II, Japan's manufacturing methods were all modern and they were outperforming ours significantly. They were so successful that Japan had come over to the United States and was buying up iconic properties everywhere, including Rockefeller Center in New York, Pebble Beach Golf, uh, Firestone Tyrone and Rubber, Columbia Pictures, and on and on and on. And an awful lot of people were worried that Japan was going to overtake the U.S. economically, which just was unthinkable uh, because we'd been uh, a world leader for you know close to 100 years. Part of Japan's success was due to their centralized economy. The government decided which industries would get priority over other industries, to get resources and funding, things like that. In the 1990s, Japan entered a slump, however, that lasted for more than 20 years. And you can see on this chart in the center, the Nikkei 225 index, their main stock index, was knocked down more than 80% over this 20-year period before they started to recover. Now, this was due to the unintended consequences of a government-controlled centralized economy. Now, anyone who follows economics knows that inflation is caused by too many uh, dollars chasing too few goods. And it tends to bid the price of the goods up because people are washing dollars. If they want something, they just spend money and pushes prices up in general. Deflation is the opposite. It's too many goods chasing too few dollars. And it doesn't matter if there's dollars out there, like our government is printing dollars. If people and companies aren't willing to spend those dollars, they're not really in circulation and it affects this deflationary dynamic. And deflation is worse in many ways than inflation. Inflation uh, destroys uh, savings, CDs and bonds and things like that tend to get er eroded by inflation. Deflation puts businesses out of business. And all of a sudden, your opportunity for future growth is just gone. And uh, so in many ways, it's worse than inflation. And it's a lot harder to reverse deflation than inflation. Japan's problem in the 1990s and 2000 was deflation in their economy. And for the past 10 or 20 years, China's booming economy has been driven by investments in factories, skyscrapers, infrastructure projects, and things like this. This booming housing market that they've had some years has accounted for more than 25% of their entire economy. So this is a big deal. All of this sparked an extraordinary period of growth that lifted China out of poverty uh, and made it an economic giant. Now, there's many similarities in the government-controlled economies of 1980s Japan and China today. And for many years, I've wondered when the wheels were going to start coming off the market in or the economy in China, uh, like they did in, in Japan, because I believe that no one, not even a dictatorial government like they have in China, is more powerful than a free market. And eventually the free market is going to assert itself. Well, it's finally happening in China and it may happen in a big way. And deflation is part of that scenario. According to the World Bank, over the last 50 years, China has increased its per capita income 25 times. It's lifted more than 800 million Chinese out of poverty. This is more than 70% of the world's reduction in poverty for that period of time. The whole world, 70% of that came from China. Now, China evolved from a nation racked by famine into the world's second largest economy and our greatest competitor for leadership. However, China's economy is still considered an emerging market by investors because they don't have standardized accounting that's transparent. They don't have a rule of law that governs business as well as individuals. They sort of make things up as they go away. In fact, as you can see in this 17-year chart uh, of the Chinese stock market, which is in red, that's the Hang Seng Index, their biggest stock market index, uh, for the last 17 years, this chopped up and down, but largely gone sideways. Each time that it gets back to the, the previous peak, it doesn't break through it. It just retreats another 30 or 40 percent. So these peaks are really going sideways. They're not rising. It's a sort of a stagnant market, despite the, the ballyhooed growth of, of China over the last few decades. Now, for the past 17, this past three years, as you can see in this next chart, the stock market over there in China has lost 48 percent of its value. They've been in a big 
bear market. They haven't recovered from the COVID-19 lockdowns, which over there were much more severe than they were over here. China is drowning in debt. They they printed a lot of, uh, borrowed a lot of money uh, to finance all of these bridges and airports and millions of apartments that are unoccupied are all financed and they need to pay these debts off. They're having trouble doing that. Another economic tidbit is that China's youth unemployment rate is so bad that their government stopped reporting the numbers a few months ago. Uh, the last report, according to BBC, was that the youth unemployment rate was 20%, and that was June of 2023. Now, having no jobs waiting is a record 11 million university graduates are expected to enter the job force is going to be a big problem for these guys. China's number one problem is providing food and paycheck for hundreds of millions of peasants and young people entering the workforce. Even a dictatorship like they've got in China can't handle an uprising of millions of people. So full employment is a way to keep the natives from getting sort of restless, if you know what I mean. Uh, one huge unintended consequence of the one child per family law that they had in effect for almost 40 years, was, which was designed to help the country avoid famines. It made a lot of sense. But as an unintended consequence, China now has an aging labor force. There's many more people wanting to retire than there are young people coming into the economy. And productivity of an economy is measured by the number of workers times what they produce. And this dynamic of fewer people working reduces the overall productivity of the economy and threatens the increasing standard of living that its people have gotten used to. Now, the outlook has darkened considerably in recent months. According to Bloomberg, manufacturing activity is contracted by 14% and is contracted and exports have declined by 14%. One of China, China's largest surviving property developers called Country Garden Holdings is on the cusp of a possible default as the overall economy slips into deflation. Remember, deflation, there's less money circulating. Too many goods chase too few dollars. There's too few dollars to have the economy run efficiently. And these companies need to get their hands on dollars to pay these debts. Most of their jet debt is in dollar denominations. They borrowed it around the world, and it's not denominated in the Chinese currency. Evergrande, which was once China's biggest real estate firm, revealed this summer that in 2021, they lost a combined $81 billion. That's a B on front of that number. According to BBC News, Evergrande is carrying $300 billion in debt. Now, $300 billion is equivalent to the, the sovereign debts of the governments of big countries like Portugal, Philippines, Malaysia. So this is just one company in China that's got that much more debt, and they're having trouble paying it back. Deflation is really difficult for people who have borrowed money, and China's got that problem in spades. Evergrande's share price is down 99% from where it was three years ago. And that tells me that Evergrande is sort of circling the drain, getting ready to perhaps go down the drain for good. Meanwhile, government crackdowns in China have put uh, onerous restrictions on, camp on industries like technology, and media, and education, and even food delivery. This saps the, the confidence of the, uh, the business community and, and leaves industry reeling. They don't know what to do. These kind of restrictions have prompted both individuals and companies to save their cash rather than spend it, which increases this too little money in the economy to chase all the goods uh, dynamic that is deflationary. Now, BBC News reports that they don't have inflation because their CPA, uh, CPI uh, inflation measure in June was flat. It was not rising, uh, which means there's excess money in the economy. Producer prices over there, which is at the, at the manufacturer's level, uh, tend to lead an economy up or down, they've gone into a tailspin over there. So their economy has some downward motion in it before it's going to recover. Uh, that's about all we know. You, the, my crystal ball gets a little cloudy out past uh, maybe the end of the year. But right now, they've got a problem. And deflation over there may be bigger than previously imagined because it's driving everything over there. So my advice, uh, if you're interested in investing in China, is children, don't try this at home. Uh, be very, very careful if you're investing in China uh, because they're in for a really rocky ride uh, over the next few months, perhaps the next number of years.